Right, I think we'll probably kick off now then. So thank you very much for coming to the fifth, uh, the repository fringe number five um, session. So hopefully you're here expecting to see the third lot of the uh, Fetch Tutor. We've got uh, seven presentations to run through, six minutes 40 each, so it should be pretty good. We're changing the format ever so slightly from yesterday afternoon, so if you're in here watching them then, we were sort of doing them in bunches of three, followed by questions. But instead, we're actually just going to have questions directly after each presentation. So for those of you who are presenting, if you can sort of come down, swap over the microphone while we're having those questions, obviously please be ready to ask questions because we'll try and keep it all going, running quite quickly. Um, a couple of announcements that we've been asked to give out first. Um, if you look at your programme, there's a session on sort of after this, which is where the developer challenge entries are all going to be giving their um, verbal submissions. Those are always great fun, and um, so if you haven't come along to one of those, I'd really recommend it. And sort of as an incentive to that, there's free beer and free drinks out in the concourse. So grab one or two or more of those, and then if you sort of head up to um, the first floor to the mezzanine, it's sort of up in the lecture theatre up there, so sort of follow everyone. The other thing to note is um, on, the, on your sort of programme that you've got, it says dinner starts at half seven. Dinner does start at half seven, drinks start at seven. So if you can sort of make sure you're there, you know, well before 7.30, that'd be great. You know, any time after seven at the museum, um, you'll be able to get in and have a drink. So that's sort of the notices and the official side of things. So if we get going with the presentations. First up, we've got Robert. No, we haven't. We've got Norman. I'm looking at the wrong session. Norman from the uh, local University of Glasgow. Um, not that local. But I'll turn to the country, Dan. <laughs> An hour on the train. Um, so if we load these up, and oh, we'll get going. <coughs> and over to you. Okay. The time is for the first timer. These are going now, so we get. I'm going to talk about Afro Davis, which is a project funded by JISC. Uh, at the University of Glasgow and Edinburgh, and the font's all gone funny because PowerPoint is awful, uh, done by me and Robert Mann at the Royal Observatory Edinburgh. The problem being addressed is that astronomers are good at uh, sharing data, that's more or less sorted, but rather poorer at sharing knowledge. After Davis is about turning that around and making it easy to share uh, knowledge through annotation. Uh, the, the, oh, Yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you seven. Uh, the, with, the data is, is, is more or less sorted out because there's a thing called the International Virtual Observatory Alliance, which is a consortium of consortium, more or less, but, uh, between multiple uh, international virtual observatory uh, projects, which have, I mean, well, the W3C of, of this sharing data in the form of images and catalogues. Catalogues are of this sort of thing, a collection of stars, typically, and other things with a unique repository ID on the left there, but that's repository specific, plus uh, traditions and other stuff, other data. That's so much for data. Journals are dealt with by the astrophysical data system, so-called, which has full text of all sorts of, uh, of, of journals and links between uh, uh, things back and forth. They're not the only source of uh, journal, of, of text, however, because there's also uh, as well as an archive.org, which you may have heard of, it's a large preprint archive where a large fraction of the discipline's uh, text is available uh, before, before published. Now, both of these things are very good, they contain vast quantities of knowledge, but they don't necessarily, uh, th that, that, that knowledge is not readable other than by, by humans. You can ask questions like this, for example, give me all the sources in this catalogue, this list of stars, which are quasars because the positions and so on in the catalogue are measurements, they're data. Whereas it is a quasar, it's a bit of interpretation. So you want to ask that question, but you can't. Now it should be easy, because there's only one sky, and everyone agrees on how to identify positions in the sky. There's that position, that position, that position. However, that doesn't quite work for, for relating uh, between catalogues, because uh, the positions in the catalogues uh, are, has an error, a observed observational error. So you want to be able to say things like, this object in this catalogue is a quasar. That's a nice simple thing to say. It's a bit of interpretation, a bit of knowledge that is in the paper, but isn't manifest in the, the actual uh, catalogue itself. You want to be able to state that you know, for your own purposes and, and, and share that as well. 
as well as that, you want to be able to see the object blah 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 in this catalogue and the object blah 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 in this catalogue are the same object. Remember, the problem there is that you can't, because the, the unique IDs in each catalogue are uh, catalogue specific, you can't, there, there's no one name for a star is the problem, is the fundamental problem. This is a common thing you want to do, it's called cross matching and it's very computationally very expensive. You want to save the results. So, the problem is that uh, cross-matching is important but expensive. As cross-matching, you're saying this star and that star are the same thing. It's not shared because it's repository specific. And it can be inter-archived inter because it just doesn't work. So the solution is al alphabet soup. Uh, I'll mention these in a bit more detail later on. Uh, the user, the ADQL is an SQL extension for astronomy. Uh, Oxidine, tap I'll mention. So we are interested in adding public and private annotations to one and two object, object annotations with uh, some more conventional things here. So, number one, TAP, Table Access Protocol. This is one of the uh, standards of the IVOA, this International Vertical Observatory Alliance, has developed. It's about a standard access to possibly very, very various uh, catalogues, and it has a lot of take up in, the, in this world. Also, there is uh, a thing called Object Eye, which was actually developed uh, near Edinburgh, and this is about uh, distributed access to databases. So you make a, a SQL query uh, to your August Dive service, it breaks it apart, sends it off to multiple databases, gets the results back, merges them together, and it's as if you had uh, queried the multiple database uh, together. We use that in a clever way because we have a user uh, making a, an, an ADQL, a, a, a custom SQL query to a TAP service, a standard thing, the, the user's client knows how to do that. That turns into an August Dive query which fires the query off to multiple databases, one of which is our annotation database, and the results come back, which is very lovely. The schema that, uh, that we are exposing uh, to this, the annotation schema, is dead simple. Nothing, nothing exciting here. Uh, a, a very simple and fixed unary uh, annotation uh, schema and a, a, a binary one. Nothing complicated. Uh, the simplicity and rigidity of this is a virtue. That's not the only interface we have. We also have a linked data in in interface where you have, have RDF, available describing essentially the same contents as the RDVMS style thing. That's still a bit, uh, a, a, a bit uh, non-finalized. There's more, there's more to do there. So moving on from that, uh, the fe features here are tightly focused, you know, a simple rigid schema with nothing, nothing exotic. It's better to do one thing well than two things badly. Uh, this builds on lots of existing standards. We did not do a lot of this work, and that's, a, and that's another virtue. The challenging thing, though, is encouraging take-up. There are a lot of people using TAP services around the world, and we have to encourage them to start using this. That's where the value will come from. So the next steps coming are, this is currently running as a sort of alpha come beta service. Uh, it's going to be integrated into the white field astronomical units uh, offering that at the, at the observatory here in Edinburgh over the summer, whenever the summer is. We're a bit, bit vague with that. Uh, here are the URLs. First of all, the project site, uh, there's not a lot there at present, but you can have a look, feel free to have a look. Uh, the source repository, our not very well updated blog, and a paper on the archive describing what we've done here. And the final thing is me, and that is where I will stop. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if we've got a question or two while we get next week lined up. Oh, come on, someone must have a question. Or is it all too lucid that you have nothing left to ask? Yeah, I'm so disappointed in you. <laughs> do better next time. Do you, do you think that these sort of methods and te techniques are applicable to other repositories and other areas, or is it so specific to uh, that area? The, the, what we've coded, no, not very much, because the, what, what we've done is uh, pretty specific to the problem we're trying to solve. I mean, we're doing one thing well. But the general approach is, I think, uh, eminently uh, uh, repurposable uh, with suitable data. The, 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 it's called Astrodavis because it's a sort of second version of called uh, BioDAS, which is the biological community's similar annotation type thing. So it's, it, the same idea done twice worked better the second time and will work even better the third time. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, we've got Leah talking about collaborative augmentation. So I will make sure I start with Stuart. So 
Does anyone want to give me a countdown from five? This will make it easier for can me you, and Stuart can to, you hear me? Okay. Sorry, yeah, sorry to, to, to coordinate ourselves. So, are you can join me? Five, four, four three, three, two, one. one. Go. Hi, I'm Leah, and I'm with the University of Alberta Libraries in Canada. Our team is extending consulting and development support to a digital humanities repository initiative located um, in Canada called Quark. And I'm happy to have this opportunity to describe what Quark is today. Um, collaboration in the humanities is what Quark is all about. These dots and lines represent authors of papers at the DH 2011 conference at Stanford. You can see mostly these are multi-authored papers, lots of connections between scholars happening in that corner of the humanities. Uh, Kenneth Price says that for collaboration, it's a condition for literary scholarship in the digital age. But in humanities fields that don't define themselves as digital humanities, collaboration is just more of a mandate than a reality. Um, credit goes to single authorship. A recent study found that in literary and linguistic computing, about half of publications were multi-authored, but in American literary history, that rate drops to 2%. Uh, further investigation shows that this trend holds across all humanities disciplines. So inside that red box, we see in Canada and in the world, for all humanities fields, multi-authored collaborative works hover around 10% or lower. So that's the collaborative or non-collaborative culture of humanities scholarship. And such is the distance between the digital humanities and the humanities at large. Um, so the challenge in thinking about humanities and collaborations is a cultural one. Um, how do we bridge this technological divide? Um, on what technological basis can that cultural shift seem feasible and maybe easier than it otherwise would be? Digital infrastructures right now for the humanities are not well suited to meet this challenge um, because isolation is everywhere. Isolation of people, their skills, of resources, projects, standards, training. Um, isolated stories of failure, isolated collaborative opportunities, old stubborn organizational silos everywhere. So I'm describing here an infrastructure project that aims to help bridge that distance by fostering both collaboration and a digital scholarly production amongst literary scholars, uh, building a dynamic repository that seeks to convince scholars of the advantages of open, collaborative, processual research. Quark's built on an active community of researchers in a strategic set of pilot projects covering a wide range of activities. Quark stands for Writing in and About Canada. By that we mean a wide variety of writing within an online research infrastructure supporting collaboration through creating, sharing, and enhancement of text. The Quirk Repository will sit um, on Fedora with its support for preservation, metadata, and object management. Um, but its aim is not to create a static collection, but to build a living environment. In this environment, scholars will continually contribute and augment content enhancing, editing, not just their own, but others' data as well. Quirk will breathe new life into old content silos, so this is an early unparalleled index of advertisements and editorial works in pre-1900 Canadian magazines. Huge interest um, to literary, publishing, and media historians, but right now it's only available on CD-ROM, um, and it's disappeared for most Canadian research libraries. Collections will um, not only be polished, peer-reviewed scholarship, but also scholars gathering some materials they're working on works of progress, most of which is never formally published. So here's a view of what someone working on Canadian poet E. Pauline Johnson might begin to gather into her own personal quirk collection. Or such materials may become new kinds of scholarly examples. So this example collection includes the hundreds of bibliographic records and informer scholarly notes that went into the making of a book. But no, not a published project, but a gold mine for people working in similar areas. So here's the vision for the architecture and layers. The repository pulls in data from the comments of Quirk users. Web services has tools for resource production and management. And on top is a user-friendly interface. Um, and what's important there is that it's geared towards the um, average humanities scholar and not a digital humanities expert. The development strategy is to use open source front-end Fedora solutions for managing data metadata access control to develop content models and workflow system components with the island or a digital humanities sprout and to build on existing open source components for text analysis and visualization this is a model representing the relationship between the key components of the quirk repository 
So what we've got is an entity management module, uh, port content management, it's called a workflow management module with the Islandora stack, and a role-based rights module. Um, and the analysis and editing services are interacting with workflow management. Workflow goes like this. Um, so from left to right, different contributors are involved at different stages. So one person submits, and then one person researches, writes, tags it. Others check it for accuracy against sources, review the content. Uh, next, a bunch of cleanup um, activities. Um, text is reviewed and approved one last time, and then it's published. How will Quirk succeed? Um, the position is that it's social, not technical aspects of collaborative tools that will define their success. So that requires an interaction on the part of the scholars um, between their experience and leaps of faith. Um, so it's cultural. So Quirk must address key cultural factors in its design. So the repository addresses trust by permitting privacy and encouraging early exposure of work. Supports credit with attribution for collaborative work, peer review, support for emergent scholars. Methods for managing distributed contributions will address these silo tendencies and roles and responsibility definition. Um, will promote effective teams inside this uh, dynamic, organic, ever-evolving environment. Um, thank you for your time. Um, I'm happy to try to address general questions. Um, also, there are some other places I can refer to you to for information on the technical infrastructure. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? I've got a comment that that was great. I work on the island or on the Unit project on the initial humanities group. I used to feel like I learned something too. <laughs> Are all the slides going to be up somewhere? Yeah. Any other questions? So, yep, yeah, one in the middle. I have a question about the. I can the microphone. Gap between rich and poor countries. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, uh, developing countries like India and uh, the, now that open access is evolving now. Now it is taking place. Whereas in developing countries, it is already rich. Yeah. So, in your paper, you have presented that the gap between the have and have nots. Mm. Okay, what is the suggestion? How to improve? How to come out from that? And also you are mentioning of the collaborative research. Mm -hmm. The collaboration with the countries, people. So, is there any uh, uh, strong uh, uh, suggestion from your side? Um, so, as I understand your question, you're, you're talking about sort of collaborative, whether there's collaborative opportunities between like the developing world yes. and exactly. a nation like Canada that's yes. got this, like we've got yes. this three and a half million dollar grant to work on this. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I, I'm not the principal investigator on this initiative, um, but I, I feel pretty comfortable saying that um, I'm sure that Susan would be um, open and interested to really working with anyone who would be willing to work with this project or contribute some ex expertise or opinions. Okay. Um, the collaboration is the focus of it, and it, yeah, yeah. the base philosophy is yes, that yes. Exactly. everything is better if exactly. people working together. Yeah, exactly. Say, say for adaptability. Say, suppose if you take a mobile, if I purchase five years back, it's a old one. If I purchase now a new one, I get a lot of facilities. Mm. Okay, that is the main concept of the collaboration also. Adaptability also is very important. A have not and have are inclusive or exclusive, exclusive of the society. That's a major point I observed. Okay, thank you very much. That's an excellent question. Thank you very much. Okay, so third up now we've got Kester talked about consortial repository environments. So if you give Stuart and Stuart Give us a, a countdown for five again and then we'll be in sync. So five, four, four three, two, two one. one. Hi, my name is Kirsten Stoppelfeld. I'm a librarian working as a manager with the Islandora project at the University of Prince Edward Island. My presentation has way less content than those presentations. I'm sorry. I'm here to talk about consortial repositor repositories, notably to point out an Islandora-based strategy utilized by two separate groups who will introduce in one minute. 
First, I have what I am sure is a big surprise for OR attendees. There are more repositories than there used to be. By way of illustration, here's Open Door's great map. They, re they report that registered repositories have doubled since 2007. As repositories multiply and emerge in mainstream institutional services, consortial approaches become more attractive, just like they have been for the acquisition of any main service from monograph purchasing to database subscriptions. So working together makes sense. Not only are there economies of scale for hardware, software, and personnel, but great opportunities for knowledge acquisition, both within an institution and in the larger community. There's also an argument that a consortial repository can lead better preservation through things like distribution of responsibilities and data redundancy. That said, institutions value their special snowflake status, and they should. No individual institution is well served when local staff's understanding of the uniqueness of their client populations is overridden. However, this service orientation presages valid concerns about security, discovery, and user experience in a consortial repository. Big, homogenizing, single portal approaches to shared repositories are less likely to please and serve. Today's examples, Carl and Call, have arguably found an interesting way to address these issues. Carl stands for the Colorado Alliance of Research Libraries, a consortium of 10 institutions located in Colorado and Wyoming. Founded in 1974, um, they started researching their Alliance Digital Repository, or ADR, in 2004. Karen I know lots more about because it's the one I work with, and Karen stands for the Call Atlantic Islandora Repository Network, and Call stands for the Council of Atlantic University Libraries, which has 18 member institutions and has been active since about 1997. We've been working on Karen since about 2010. Both Carl and Call, I'm going to definitely mess that up, store consortial assets in one great big Fedora repository, which is babysat by a given institution or group. Assets in the repository are demarcated by namespace. This means that each institution has a namespace under which digital materials belonging to that institution are ingested or added to the repository. Atop the single repository, a Drupal multi-site with Islandora modules installed allows for each institution to have a separate web interface that can be designed to address a particular user group or showcase a given portion of the repository. Each one is configured to reveal assets by namespace and collection. One benefit of this approach is that it allows for flexible reorganization of assets. We can, but we don't need to, map sites, institutions, namespaces as one to one to one. Collections or sites can be built to showcase assets across institutions by simply exposing a new collection or changing the namespace configuration of the site in Islandora. For example, Karen is talking about a regional map and newspaper collection that would draw from several institution namespaces. Separate interfaces also provide a way for administrators at the institution to manage and protect their assets, the assets they've contributed. Here's a screenshot of the ZACML editor. ZACML policies are one way that Fedora manages security. Here a site administrator can manipulate policies uh, for editing and viewing down to the data stream level. And for those of you who are not Fedoraers, one could, for example, expose only metadata to anonymous users. When you're dealing with different institutions in a shared repository environment, there's also the issue of many different types of content. Content as we understand it, maps, letters, and images. Content as a computer understands it, as a mime type. Content that an archivist wants. Content that a fast and fancy website needs. Both projects are using Fedora's flexible object con content modeling architecture to preserve and improve pre-existing resources. So Karen is currently using a default set of Islandora content models, and Carl's got a number of customized content models, including something called ADR Basic. Jonathan's here. You can talk more about that if you have questions. And it acts as a catch-all for anything digital. Content models define the makeup of an object in a repository and define things like what metadata is associated with it. And this is important because metadata and search are really contentious issues. Uh, again, the metadata that already exists, there's the metadata the group wants, and what metadata means for search and discovery, which not everybody always understands. A shared metadata stream can vastly improve cross-institution or repository searching, but may disregard the specialties a given schema has for cataloging or individual cataloging cultures. Both Carl and Call have taken existing metadata in XML from contributing institutions and are storing it alongside mods in DC. Uh, these are crosswalked from that original data stream, and the mods is indexed for searching. Call has a mandate to facilitate searching on similar topics across Atlantic Canada, so this is the search available from the main project website. But there are site-specific searches, so you can configure at a, at a repository level and then at a specific level. So uh, in specific sites, weighing fasting has been configured under the guidance of an institution-specific group. So this is a, these are the results for a search on Joseph conducted in the Regis University Digital Repository, and I think these two give you an example of how different ser searches can look or feel. Both projects have seemed to emerge without demanding the consensus across organizations that can be difficult and occasionally impossible or ridiculously expensive to achieve. 
The environments they have created are not rigid or prescriptive. With apologies to Lorna Goodison, the spectacular Jamaican poet, these working groups are DJs or dub organizers. They're not symphony conductors. Both systems use the open source Redmine software to collectively manage requests and development tasks via documents and tickets assigned to the working group. Tasks move through the system in a way that is transparent to all members, and we find this minimizes duplicated effort and highlights any competing priorities across the group. Speaking for Cairn, where institutional size varies widely, buy-in from member institutions has been achieved in part by adding value. Smaller institutions with little or no server or digital capacity welcome to the opportunity to digitize and post key collections or move from inflexible, expensive, subscription-based or commercially hosted systems. Larger institutions with established projects seem less likely to want to move with a consortial model but seem more than happy to have metadata indexed to drive additional traffic to a local system. Some have also shown a desire to duplicate their collections across multiple systems for better preservation. A flexible participation model allows for these institutions to participate without committing to an entirely different system than one they've already established. Both, Call and Cairn, both Calls Cairn and Carl's ADR are evolving projects with an interesting approach that's flexible and focuses on serving rather than disrupting existing institutional cultures. Thanks for listening to me talk about this approach because I think it's cool. As a final note, I realized when making this presentation that there's a whole lot to say about learning object repositories, and those who are interested in consortial approaches should look at learning object repositories as great examples of how that's happening. That's all. Thank you for listening. Excellent. Perfect. Good time. Thank um, you. Any questions? Yeah. I kind of feel like we don't talk about consortial repositories enough in repository of that. Like, yeah. it, I, I, it's really good to see this. Oh, it's just really good to see this kind of talk because um, I think one of the things that holds us back in the repository community, I mean, it motivates us in one way, but it, I think it also holds us back in other ways. It's just like institutional competition for who's yeah. doing it best, really. Like, when it comes right down to it, like, those of us who are trying to make these things go, that's not necessarily the point for yeah, um, was, there's a, that openness culture is really hard. Right. Even though it's a li like libraries are supposed to be built on that mandate, there's a lot of hiding about, you know, the big deal really broke apart universities, I think, you know, sort of forcing them to hide information from one another. And, yeah. So yeah. that was more of a comment. Question. Thank you. I appreciate it. I hope we get to talk more later about, <laughs> yeah. I've seen your name. We've emailed. <laughs> I'm done? Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks. Yes, it is. So next up, yeah, we have uh, yeah, that's all good. We got Dan talking about um, open repositories as social networks. So if you can give me a, a countdown again, I'll try and do my side copy this time. Um, Five. Yeah. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one, go. Um, I'm Diane Leuidaf uh, from France. I'm the VOR um, dissemination manager. So I'm going to introduce uh, VOR, the VOR project and the VOR platform into its two uh, interesting approaches, that is the open portal repository and also the open um, uh, network. Uh, the outlines of this presentation is to uh, start from Science 2.0 and then to explain what is VOR, um, plus the um, link data approach uh, the implementation of the serif model, uh, purposes, features, uh, and a conclusion. Um, researchers need to share their uh, research, their methods, their protocols to find collaboration and funds. Uh, he needs also to share uh, his discoveries uh, and uh, to share his uh, favorite uh, resources. So, um, Science 2.0 is the application of social networking technologies to scientific process. And it can be divided into three main ideas and areas. is sharing resource, re sharing research, sharing resources, and sharing resources. And it can be done by, um, through blogs, portals, uh, open platform, uh, like uh, social bookmarking, Twitter, 
um, open archive, uh, open repositories, uh, and so on. Um, this is a selection of uh, the well-known um, open portal uh, that achieved this, uh, this target um, for sharing. And VOR took some of the features of this uh, VOR platform um, for dedicated to uh, the field of agriculture. Um, so what is VOR? It's a, a European project funded by the European Commission. Uh, it's an aggregation of repositories and it provides ag access, um, open access content in the field of agriculture, environment, food, viticulture and all related uh, areas. Um, it embarks also a social networks. Uh, so this is, we are, starting, we are starting in the context of agriculture with um, a lot of um, open access literature, scientific literature available, plus a social network inside. So, in, in three lines, what is VOR? VOR is uh, open access content plus social network uh, in uh, the, the field of agriculture. But it's a bit more. Uh, the technology uh, that was developed um, was based on the semantic web technologies. Um, and when you see the architecture, you come from the OI harvesting process, and then uh, you can we we, um, we expose um, the the records in our Sparkle endpoint. We use also ontologies, a robot for keywords, and also the Europris ontology server. We uh, implemented uh, the serif model that is uh, from the Europris recommended by the European Commission. So you can mix and link the publication um, and the person, the activities, the project, the institution, and so on. Uh, the purposes. We uh, have uh, three kind of targeted audience. Researchers, practitioners, and students can connect to the platform, to the whole platform, and they can meet, discuss, um, they can um, join groups, um, and they can meet experts, so uh, it enrich uh, the collaboration, uh, and so uh, and so on. Then uh, some screenshot about the uh, a screenshot about the um, different features, so you can see uh, a mix of uh, social um, social features and um, the repository, the portal uh, features like the searches. So this, is, this mix is very interesting and it's uh, quite new uh, in a um, similar platform uh, dedicated to a topic, a research topic. You can see a record over there. So you can see that you can uh, access the resource, of course. You can add bookmark it. You can share it uh, to social networks. You can uh, discuss this resource and you can add annotation. Uh, you can join some uh, groups uh, and um, discuss about a resource, a discuss topic. This is um, the different searches options. Um, a tag cloud, well, it's, it's common, but it's uh, interesting to browse the, um, the topics. Um, also a navigational search, this is an innovative approach. It's like browsing the uh, agrovoc ontology, so you can't uh, narrow uh, the search with graphical uh, drag and drop. This is interesting. So the, uh, the conclusion is uh, join our community. Uh, you can create a profile. Um, you can um, meet uh, other experts. And you can also um, join our community by providing content through your OAE repository. Um, it can be, should be uh, OAE compliant. But we accept a lot of uh, standard formats like modes, uh, Dublin Core, uh, Agris, uh, uh, and so on. And thank you oh, uh, that you will join our community. And uh, this is a uh, dream team. <laughs> we worked a lot uh, all together. We work well. And this is me if you need to contact uh, me for further uh, information or connection. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Uh, different disciplines have slightly different
different disciplines have slightly different ideas of what it's useful to share and how they would share things. Uh, do you have any sense of how, what other disciplines nearby agriculture would use a, a very similar model? Would other biologists use this? Would, or, or? There's two things. Um, there's a um, connection with other agricultural uh, partners I mean, uh, connection with other uh, repositories or existing portals or projects. But this technology is completely open source. And uh, the sustainability is focusing on renew to reuse the portal and the, the social network for other um, uh, fields. So this is a pilot trial uh, focusing on agriculture because there was nothing uh, existing, um, such existing project. Um, but um, the aim is that this technology can be reused in uh, other fields. So we, we, we don't want to focus our connection only in the agricultural field. But uh, the, the file uh, um, that maintain agris, they are interesting in uh, emerging uh, war and, uh, and agris. I don't know if I will want to go for it. Thank you very much. Excellent. So next up, we've got John Howard talking about archive for limb care. If, um, do you want to do your own countdown? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, okay, five, four, three, three two, two, one. one. Go. All right. Thanks very much. My name is John Barnett. John Howard Barnett, and I'm at. Uh, oh, good. We're on the <laughs> University of Pittsburgh, um, and I'm going to talk about our latest repository, which is the Archive for Limb Care, uh, or uh, Archive for Essential Limb Care. Uh, I'm new to repository work. I'm a scholarly communications librarian at Pitt. I've been in this role about a year. Uh, I'm new to Pecha Kucha as well, though I will say that I did not think, as one friend told me, that I thought Pecha Kucha was um, an Incan ruin in Peru. So, uh, a little bit about uh, us. Um, here's some of the uh, some of our work that we do. Uh, we're we fall under the purview of the University Library System, and the library is an Association of Research Libraries member. Oh, this does go fast. Okay, Describe <laughs> is um, the broad name given to our digital publishing efforts, and we take that library as publisher role very seriously. Uh, there are two tracks under this heading: archives, special collections. Uh, supervises the digital research library, and we are under Information Technology, the Office of Scholarly Communication and Publishing. Uh, we don't have a website yet, so we're a fairly new office, and we deal with lots of different things. ETDs, e-journals we're very big on right now, and repositories as well. I do some training for library liaisons, trying to educate them about scholarly communication, faculty and staff, and student outreach, a little bit of everything. Um, we are, like what mostly I do lately, is subject-based archives. And to create these, we collaborate with the university, beyond the university, even beyond the US. Um, we uh, have six of these uh, at present. And here's our first one, the Phil Site Archive, which is kind of our best example. Though we work with Pitt Center for the Study of the Philosophy of Science. Um, and they've developed a very active preprint repository. Uh, the board is very, their editorial board is very engaged in acquiring and reviewing materials, and they've made considered efforts, as this show, to make arrangements with international conferences to deposit their proceedings in the archive. Next up, Minority Health and Health Equity Archive it takes a different approach. It's a project done in conjunction with the University of Maryland and works more as a database than a repository with links to great literature and government and NGO publications on healthcare issues in, among minorities, visible minorities in the U.S. For the aphasiology archive, uh, we work with the annual clinical aphasiology conference, setting up a paper submission process through public knowledge projects, open conference systems. Then after the conference, we move the abstracts into the archive, enhancing metadata for the entries. 
Uh, and believe it or not, we do pay attention to the EU and have developed an archive of European integration, which is done in conjunction with the Center for European Studies at Pitt. Um, but we also have a library subject specialist who actively works with EU entities to build the archive. Um, he takes a more traditional approach to organization using subject headings, creating precise metadata. Um, and it's considered one of the best sources for EU-oriented publications, at least by us. All right. so. This leads us to the Archive for Essential Limb Care, our latest effort, which just launched a couple of weeks ago. Um, and the idea is to provide a source for practitioner materials for the treatment and prevention of lower limb wounds and disabilities in low resource settings. Uh, it's a joint effort between the International Legs to Stand On project. This is, it's based on ePrints, that's what we use. Uh, we're one of the few US libraries that actually uses ePrints, I believe. Um, and this is the out-of-the-box version, which we do a lot of work with, a lot of work to make turn into something different. Um, we transform, working with the leader, the editorial board, um, our system staff, our web services staff, to uh, do design and layout, uh, uh, item types and fields, subject organizations, social media and citation tools, workflows, and more. Um, and this is where we, uh, what we end up with. Um, uh, I've lost track of my slides here. Okay, so this is what we end up with. You get an idea of what it looks like. Um, I coordinate a lot of the efforts behind this. Um, like I said, I've lost my place here. Okay, we got that. Um, okay, some of the problems that came up in the process of this and my working with people was the faculty who were involved in the project we're definitely not librarians. There was a lot to explain. There was a lot about terminology, copyright, metadata, digitization. So they were lost a fair amount of the time. And to give you some ideas, they, um, with copyright, I would spend a lot of time explaining about Creative Commons licensing, copyright policy, when to check Sherpa Romeo to determine publishers' policies, and no, you don't need to do that for proceedings and reports, just do it for articles. There was a lot to explain to them. Metadata was also a huge area where I did a lot of explaining. Basic concepts about official URLs and how to create a URL or get one, find the right one, DOIs, differences in item types and fields. Um, at one point, I had to convince the editorial board that it was not a good idea to not make the item type required and just delete that in the workflow process. There was a lot to explain. Digitization and terminology also. Basic terms, repository versus archive, why we might want to use one or the other, what an embargo was, and how a journal embargoes things differently than a repository would, why there are creators, not necessarily authors. Um, and it just posed a lot of problems for them. And digitization was a huge area that was hard for them to understand. We have a lot more work to do. Um, we've got to put ourselves in DOAJ, uh, optimize our searching, a lot of design enhancements, field work, service level agreements as opposed to memos of understanding. But I also found my issue was I'm based in IT, information technology. And I'm, as to quote one of your famous Welshman, I'm the only librarian in the village. I, uh, it's hard to sustain momentum and it's hard to create, kind of convey these ideas to people in IT, things that worry me, such as reliable metadata, consistent metadata. I don't think we do enough of that. We're also providing uh, information on uh, medical information to the developing world and are we doing this correctly? Are we doing this accurately? Shouldn't we have a policy to pull that information out if we need to. And I don't feel like we've got enough going on there. So there you go. That was really fast. <laughs> Thank you very much. Questions? Yeah, In your presentation you mentioned a library as a publisher. Yes. In my opinion, library is an information center. A library is an information center. Okay. A library is a knowledge center. A library is a storehouse. How can you act as a publisher? Then what is the difference between the publisher and the library? This is a good question and probably one that I could go on for a while about. And I'm not sure I could give the, the definitive answer on this one. We've certainly taken on that role. I, I would say 
a lot of the things we're doing with subject repositories is less about publishing and more about dissemination because a lot of times those things are published in other ways or made available in other ways. But we have taken on a role as has some other US libraries, academic libraries, to be a journal publisher, to create open act, work with editorial boards to create open access journals. Uh, and that's starting to happen more and we have at least 30 at this point. I, having worked in publishing before, I have the same questions you do, but I, <laughs> there's not a lot I can say about that. I, it's my concern too, but I do think the idea of providing information is this is another way that we do this, and an important way that we do this, and one that takes us maybe more out of the loop of being reliant on uh, very expensive publishers that we've had to rely on in the past to uh, provide information. So it, it's a good question, and mm -hmm. I, I think I think there's some room for debate on that yeah. one. But I, I think we see ourselves as very actively trying to push open access yes, at yes. any at any. Uh, any chance we get. Okay. In a general definition, institutional repository is the output of the faculties, the students, the output of the institutions. Uh, we do, yeah. Our, this is a bit different than we're working with an international body and international um, uh, groups, organizations. But our institutional repository, yes, yes. that is one other thing I, I work with and that we're trying to pull in. Uh, resources from students, faculty, uh, trying to do a mandate now, an open access policy mandate, so that they have to uh, try to provide some content, even if it's just a metadata entry about the, uh, their work, their output. Thank you. Right. Okay. So. so we've got Val from Space <coughs> talking about fighting off um, this is covering up. Where are we? Biting off what the community can chew. Is that good? Oh. Cool. Okay. Five, four, four three, three, two, two one. one. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Valerie from Duraspace. I'm the director of community programs. Um, and as most of you know by now, Duraspace is the organization, a not for profit organization that supports, uh, that provides guidance and leadership uh, to both DSpace and Fedora software projects. Um, today I'm going to talk about some small bites of collaboration on some learning resource materials, a project that um, uh, DuraSpace and our communities have been working on for about a year. This is very much a work in progress and we're still finding our way through the best practices, but I wanted to share some ideas with you. Um, on the menu, open source of course. Open source, as everyone knows, relies on user communities to, um, for contributions. Um, we did solicit um, some, in, some feedback from our communities about what they were hungry for, what they wanted, and the reason we worked on this project was because they wanted some uh, better resources and learning materials for uh, the now for uh, both DSpace and Fedora. So what are some of the key things that they told us they wanted? Well, they wanted a dynamic, multi-dimensional um, guide or resource, something different than just the documentation, which tends to get kind of technical. They also wanted more showing and not as much telling. And they also wanted a comprehensive guide, not just um, sections or how-tos that are on the wiki. So here's the home page of the knowledge base. This is the umbrella page. It's a separate section for both DSpace and Fedora. Um, and just like the DSpace and Fedora software, it's designed to have the community contribute and evolve as they see fit. Um, and we have the firm belief that this is the best and most useful content will actually come from the community of users. So how does collaboration happen? Well, the table is set. We've set the table to make sure that there's um, a, top, a topical outline to start with, but it can easily be changed and evolved as people see fit. There's sample content showing contributors exactly how to contribute, and contributors can pick um, what they want to write based on their expertise. And most importantly, all bytes are wafer thin. <laughs> the most important uh, design feature that things are very accessible and hopefully a uh, contributor can make something in less than an hour or about an hour um, and as their schedule see fits. Uh, for a lot of topics, you do not have to do things from scratch. There are plenty of learning uh, materials out there, resources out there that you can use as a starting point and just adapt and update. Um, wiki pages, how-tos, do tutorials, uh, our official docs can all be references. 
Um, in terms of making um, the visitor to the knowledge base get a clear understanding, um, we want to make sure we develop multiple, multiple uh, types of content, text guides, images, diagrams, code snippets, uh, recorded screencasts, and there's guidance for contributors on how to do each one of those, um, as well as suggested tools. Um, we also have rules for sharing and remixing um, content. It all comes under the Creative Commons Share Alike uh, uh, copyright, which means it can be remixed, sold, encouraging people to make improvements and, and um, do whatever they want with the content as well as contribute back. And of course, we give attribution to the original author and the knowledge base. Well, things can get messy, of course, and to keep them from getting so, we had to think about what to do um, to address this. So for a variety of reasons, content can get outdated, it could use more examples, maybe it wasn't complete when the original author put it um, on the knowledge base, or maybe it's new content that needs to get validated. So to ensure quality, once we're geared up, we are going to be um, having content, uh, co content moderators from the community who regularly review the content, um, and they can uh, put up status banners that will clearly indicate to the visitor um, what they're getting so they know and are aware. So have we had any bites? Um, have we had activity since we launched um, in 2011 and made our call for contributions? Well, it started out a little slow, um, but we have run a contest and in the last few months activity seems to have picked up a bit. Um, so that's encouraging. Uh, we're still working to find contributors and encouraging people we know who have good stuff to uh, put put it into the knowledge base. So putting it all together and how this translates and what I would recommend um, for other people endeavoring to do something like this, get feedback early and often in your design um, and leave a lot of room for a flexible structure and organization, provide a lot of specific examples um, and make chunks small or way through thin. Um, if you build it, will they come? Well, um, it's pretty early for us with the knowledge base, but we're hopeful that will be successful and see more activity as people will hear, hear and learn more about it. My suggestion for anyone starting something similar is to keep your bites small and your ambitions elephant-sized. <laughs> I'm so proud I got Mr. Creosote into a presentation. That's my lifelong dream. <laughs> I'm pretty scared. Well. Any questions? No. I suppose one question, how have you sort of found it? How much content is there now? I suppose it's been going, is it a year or so since you started Well, about yeah, we, we, so we started a year ago with sort of the brainstorming session and then we officially called for contributions starting in January. So we had a handful of contributions in addition to what we sort of seeded in there. So it's, it's encouraging that there has been some participation and, and certainly the people that have contributed are, appear to be ones that will come back and contribute more. So, um, And this is a perfect place, the OR, there's lots of tutorials and stuff, so if you have good stuff on Fedora or vSpace, um, at least post it into the knowledge base um, so people can find your stuff more easily. So. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And finally, for the last session of the day now, we've got um, Thorsten talking about um, some of the work he's been doing at Inspire. So, for the last time, I know what to say. <laughs> Four, three, three, two, two, two one. one. Actually, this was, uh, was a great introduction to uh, some of what I want to talk about, uh, soci sociological aspects and uh, how we engage all our users. Uh, this is a talk about... Uh, not the technological background of the service we're running, but how we uh, approach our users, know that we actually serve their interests, uh, and so on. So uh, this is the website, Inspire. It's a high energy physics abstracting service that increasingly also has full text, very simple, but has an extremely powerful search interface. As a large number of users, pretty much every high energy physicist is using this on an almost daily basis. It is very feature rich, it has full text snippets, it has a powerful search syntax, it has detailed records and all kinds of output formats, it has citation summaries, it, you can print out if you have 200 papers, your CV in a LaTeX format, <laughs> if you want to apply somewhere, provides all kinds of services. 
it is busy, we run at around two hertz, that means uh, we have two searches per second uh, of all kinds of complexity uh, across uh, uh, all days of the week. And uh, we, uh, that covers citation and reference counting and co-author networks and so on. So how do we know what our users want? Well, we have a blog to keep our users informed and on most sites we have feedback buttons where people can comment on things we are doing and they do that at the rate of 30 to 40 comments a day that all get responded to on the same day. We also have a Twitter feed uh, that we use to point to new blog posts and to point out interesting stuff and also to give status updates on the service because sometimes people uh, complain newspapers aren't there yet or the citations haven't been updated yet whatnot. and whatnot and now if we have service outages we keep our users informed. Uh, so one uh, thing that our users demand is uh, rich author profiles uh, and author profiles are difficult because of name variants uh, and uh, uh, DOIs and ORCID will make that a lot easier but uh, currently this is all done with a lot of manual input and manually curated but as I said we have uh, feedback loops on all these pages uh, the user can update these records, the affiliation history, and you can also verify that it's them or create a new one. So on almost all Inspire pages, you have this kind of like immediate feedback where a user can correct the information, add information, augment information, and therefore make the information that we have better and more reliable. Now, all these feedbacks are actually automatically processed but then verified by human curators. Uh, you can log in either through archive or as a guest user. If you log in through archive into Inspire, you get your publication list pre-populated from all the papers that archive knows belong to you. Uh, so that's a collaboration we have with archive. Then you can go in and correct uh, the papers that belong to you are add new papers and there's a search box and there's all these correction boxes and people use that very frequently and ensure that the information is correct and uh, reliably there. Uh, one very tricky part is references and citations uh, because we extract those partially from the full text that we have fully automatically but there's a lot of manual creation happening you get publisher feeds, those are cleaner. But again, they are amendable by authors, and authors contribute a lot of work. So we have manual data entry, we have tricky machinery, but mostly we rely on, uh, on the crowd, on our users, to, and we're building on their shoulders uh, because the individual user is interested in having an accurate citation count and accurate references so that the uh, and here you see how the references look and how to update them so that the citation count is correct which is important for uh, for the career evaluation and for the Hirsch index and other metrics that are applied to research output so if you want to correct references you get into a screen like this this looks perfect and it's normalized and uh, has been uh, checked and all these uh, things that are underlined are actually links to the papers in the Inspire database so we have all the information there. On the next slide you see much dirtier uh, citations and there's definitely human intervention necessary to fill the gaps here. And we try to do that uh, with the curation effort that we have but we would be hopelessly lost to see it steady inflow of papers to actually catch up with the authors and users wouldn't help us with this. The end result is that you get to each paper you get cited by and co-cited with uh, lists and so you can actually track which paper cites which and where is related stuff and who works with whom and this kind of rich information is really useful and important to our users as we have uh, heard repeatedly also in extensive surveys that we have done uh, and so one of one of the key things that everybody that all the users are looking at is their citation summary on what papers are cited uh, what of which of the papers are important and so our approach of allowing users to curate their own data uh, is 
the one thing that allows Inspire to actually have the rich and, uh, and useful data that we have. Uh, it would otherwise be impossible to, to offer that kind of, um, of rich data. And as I said, crowdsourcing makes our users happy. This is from the announcement seminar at the Higgs, uh, the Higgs seminar at CERN on July 4th, where it was announced that they are quite certain that they have finally found the Higgs. Questions? Any questions at all? Well, it's great to see all the different features that you've been built into. So, if anybody counts correctly how many ways there are, you can provide feedback on these slides. I've <laughs> said that before. <laughs> I buy them here. <laughs> um, how do you find the citations? Do you bring in data from Scopus or Web of Science? No, that's, that's uh, only material that is in Inspire, and it's a subset of the existing literature that is uh, specific to HEP, so we don't cover quite the same as, say, ISI is covering or ABS is covering. It's a subset, and it's uh, mostly manually selected in, in the border region, but uh, everything from archive in certain subcategories is taken, and then uh, publisher feeds from publishers in, in the relevant fields like physical WD and uh, in those publications we get full text and then we run automated processes on the full text to extract the references and get uh, and normalize them and try to do uh, pattern recognition and see if we have these records. And these things would be very easy if everybody was using DOIs or a standardized form to cite and uh, we have over many years, uh, Inspire builds on Spire since it was 40 years back. And since we provide cryptic output format for records and our users adopted using that output format for their own citation database, uh, they actually have fairly normalized citations, those users. And because it's beneficial for them to have these in a normalized form, more and more users adopt it, so there's a positive feedback loop. And we see that even uh, harvesting a full text PDF and then doing PDF to text conversion and then passing for the references still has a more normalized form uh, from those users that use our new tech output. And uh, then that is. There's some heuristics applied and normalization of journal names and all these things, and then we look if we have those matches in our database and whether we can find a DOI for that. And everything that is not uniquely identified is actually being looked at by a manual curator. One more question before we finish. Yeah, thanks for your presentation. Uh, it seems like you have a pretty motivated community of physicists. Yes. What kind of, or do you have to incentivize any of the curated, or manually curated process when you're getting the physicists to do some of the things that they don't want? Uh, as I said, the big incentive is that the, that the accurate citation count is important for career development. And people have RSS feeds on their citation count and on their version index uh, where Every, every fluctuation that happens, say we have a duplicate record in the database, we remove one record that had 20 citations, that author citation count drops from 3,420 to 3,400. Uh, the author notices and asks what happened. Uh, and, and we have to explain. And there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of email overhead triggered by, by these kind of cleanups that we do, but we know that the users really care and they won't let us, let us get away with sloppiness. And uh, we, do, we do mail outs, for example, for the head names for affiliation history and those things. We have about 90,000 registered users. Uh, 39,000 of those we know the email from. We have email each and every one of them to check and verify their entries and we got response from about 16,000, so about uh, not, not quite half of them. We also know the size of the user community and in the surveys that we did, we know that the response rate was close to 80%. You know, not, not everybody goes through like 
the whole survey, which is 10 pages, but we got a lot of feedback. So yes, our community is very motivated and this makes these things easier. Thank you very much. So we just give full so and so everybody else a big round of applause. It's been a wonderful session. And then just finally a reminder for those of you that weren't in right at the very beginning. Following this now there are sort of free drinks, beers and so forth in the lobby. You're also very welcome to grab one or more of those. And then if you want to stay around for the um, developer challenge presentations, they're going to be upstairs. So grab a drink and head up there. Otherwise we'll see you at 7 o'clock rather than 7.30 for sort of pre-drinks at the museum and then do kick up about 7.30. Thank you. <laughs>